Wonderful. Hello and welcome to our GRISE webinar. Thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Meg Six and I am the Regional Director for the Midwest and Canada at GOBI. The session today will be recorded and sent to all participants on today's call. You are welcome to share the session with anyone whom you feel may benefit. Today's session will run about 45 minutes in length and we've left time at the end of the presentation for questions. Please feel free to use the chat feature to submit any questions during the presentation. During this webinar, we will learn how GRASB is growing in the commercial real estate world and see how one leading real estate investment management services firm has streamlined its GRASB reporting process to provide investors a detailed look at their building's significant sustainability progress over the past year. Additionally, we will discuss strategies on efficient GRASB preparation, submission, and outstanding results. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers for today's webinar. We have Healy Love from Gobi, Dan Winters from GRASP, and Dan Lake from Enernaw. Healy Love is the Executive Vice President of Gobi. She earned her bachelor's degree in architecture and an MBA in international business and entrepreneurship from Northwestern University. Healy now helps clients turn big data into big opportunities and implement ESG strategies through Gobi's platform and consulting services. Dan Winters is the head of the Americas for GRASB and has the responsibility of furthering GRASB's international scope by engaging institutional investors throughout North America, establishing industry partnerships, and expanding GRASB coverage among REITs and private equity firms. Dan Lake of Anarnock is a licensed mechanical engineer with a background in commercial and industrial energy efficiency. Dan has been with Anarnock for more than five years, supporting commercial and industrial energy audits retro commissioning, and new building commissioning. As a member of Enernox Energy Advisor team, Dan works directly with large commercial real estate customers to help them achieve their energy goals through the use of Enernox energy intelligence software and solutions. Dan, the stage is yours. Excellent. Thank you for that introduction. Good morning to the folks in the Midwest. Good afternoon to my colleagues on the East Coast, and of course, happy Friday to Australia. Um, my name is Dan Winters. I am the head of Americas for GRESB. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about GRESB, its uh, position in the marketplace and, and where things are headed with GRESB. Uh, maybe a little bit of a look back on our prior results and, and who's engaged and who benefits from GRESB. So those are kind of the things I want to cover. You'll see on the next slide, it's just a splash page with how to contact me. Uh, oh, slide after this. There you are. Um, and so with that, let's roll. Next slide. Great. So Gres, you know, our mission, our mission is to serve shareholders and institutional investors in particular. So when we talk about Gres, we we create this communication between institutional investors, which could be the pension funds uh, like CalPERS or State of Illinois, uh, certainly the big ones in Europe, and the managers that uh, are responsible for giving them uh, returns, investment returns on their assets. And in the real estate world, those come in two forms, either private equity firms that have private equity funds or listed companies that here in the States we call real estate investment trusts, which is a, a you know, sort of an IRS tax concept. And so we do this in the real asset sector. And so our mission is to help empower sustainability practices and, and assess funds on, on what they're doing on ESG. So let's talk about that on the next slide. Okay, if you think about market behavior and what we see, whatever industry we're talking about, and this conversation today is about real estate and, and infrastructure and real estate debt, right? But market behavior of transportation companies, airlines, software, whatnot, you see organizations on a bell curve. And there are organizations that do some real great leading things, industry leadership, there are others that kind of skirt the line on regulation. All of those uh, you know, encompass risk if from an investor standpoint. So you see this distribution of activity in all economic sectors. And so we're going to talk about that in the next two slides and what that looks like from buildings. So in the buildings, right, when you walk around whatever city that you're in, you see a building stock. And you also see buildings that are doing more than others. 
and we recognize that through market leadership with these labels and it could be down in Australia we have Green Star the neighbors energy is the equivalent of, of Energy Star here in the States obviously everybody is familiar with lead and what lead has been able to do to move the market to the right and what's important about this concept is that it's a market facing mechanism it's not the heavy hand of regulation coming in it is recognizing what leaders do and having a pull effect on the marketplace they do this through economic signaling hey this is a lead certified building this is an energy star certified building this building is different this building has better characteristics than perhaps the other building stock that are absent these signals so on the next slide you can see that this concept can also be applied to corporate practice, in particular the real estate industry. So what we do is we focus on ESG leadership, right, and the sustainability performance of, of that. Everybody has legal requirements. There are organizations that will straddle that line. There are organizations that are doing great things on, on environmental, social, and governance. That's what ESG stands for. So we're going to come back to this at the very end, but that is uh, a fundamental concept, and I want to... Uh, layout for everybody here okay next slide so investors are focused on capital markets and having those capital markets be efficient right information asymmetry is what you know uh, can hurt capital markets so you get around information asymmetry through transparency on attributes and those attributes whether it's financial attributes or management attributes and how a company works all factor into risks within the portfolio and opportunities to improve or make changes or see where, where organizations are, are embracing these opportunities and doing something better than a competitor, right? So that's really the fundamental game uh, of, of capital markets and what institutional investors care about and think about a lot. Next slide. So Grez, Grez was started in 2009. We have three different platforms. We have real estate, which is was was the core offering, right? And it assesses the ESG performance of property companies, real estate developers, and fund managers. Two years ago, we extended our offering to the other part of the capital stack, the debt side, and we have a lender uh, assessment that looks at lending practices and to the extent that organization that lenders have say targets for clean energy or green buildings or do different things in underwriting have various products on energy efficiency this gets teased out in, in the debt assessment and then last year Gresb launched the Gresb infrastructure assessment which is an extension in our focus on real assets which many of our uh, institutional investor members and clients uh, are putting big money to work and that's you know solar farms and wind farms and toll roads uh, hospitals things that are sort of social infrastructure or physical infrastructure that's all tied into buildings in our built environment next slide here's you can see some of our, our members right so we have nearly 60 institutional investors the three that are highlighted were the founding members back in 2009 that really wanted to understand the ESG constructs within their portfolio and you'll see if you click forward to the next slide something new for 2017 is we've added CalPERS and CalPERS is the biggest pension fund in North America uh, and they are actively engaging with their private equity fund investment managers to have them participate in GRESB, get a baseline understanding and benchmark of where they are compared to the, the global set on ESG issues, and then engage with them to uh, hopefully improve practices over time. That's the whole objective of GRESB. Next slide. So GRESB has three competencies, three core competencies to understand and improve ESG performance. The first thing is it's a systematic assessment. Companies, funds, separate accounts, right? And CalPERS has a number of separate accounts that are managed by private equity firms or joint venture partnerships. And we do this through objective scoring of ESG, environmental, social, and governance attributes. What's key about GRESB, and that's the B, right? The, the GRESB is an acronym, Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark, which has been shrunk as we've expanded to uh, real assets under infrastructure. But the B, the B is important. That's peer benchmarking. So uh, what we do is we put everybody in the context and, and we say, you know, you've got a peer group, that peer group 
group is lumped together by geographic region and property type on the real estate side, and then we benchmark. And we say, well, here's where you are compared to how you uh, answered and, and provided the data in, in your assessment for the 2017 year, and here's where your peers are. We show that in aggregate, and that prompts a lot of opportunities to, to say, hey, you know, peers are doing better on certain things, we're doing really well on, on certain things, and that's a stimulus for ongoing improvement within portfolios, either REITs or private equity firms. Next slide. Okay, so with our investors, they look at this in a couple different ways. Sometimes they use this for positive screening. They will look for organizations to make investments with that are best in class. Could be a GRESP three, four, or five star uh, rated fund, or a manager with a number of these kind of funds. That is a very, uh, what I'll call a helpful tiebreaker when it comes to uh, an institutional investor, one of our members making an, an allocation decision. There's also integration into the investment management process, uh, and that kind of goes hand in hand with portfolio monitoring. So GRESB is often used as an engagement tool where, where investors will say, you know, very simple questions like, how did you do on GRESB last year? What is your plan for improvement? You know, how did, how did you, you know, how are you doing with this framework, right? And it prompts a lot of thoughtful conversations. Hey, we're getting more data. Hey, we've engaged with organizations like, you know, Gobi, so now we have 100% portfolio coverage, or Enernoc, and we're doing demand response, and, you know, gee, we're, we're saving and making money, and we're doing that on, on your behalf. That's what we're hired to do. So participants, who are the private equity firms and REITs, what they get out of participating in GRES are, you know, two things. Comparative business intelligence, how are you doing against your peers? And an opportunity then to use that for gap analysis, to convene meetings internally and say, hey, you know, we, we couldn't answer yes to question, I don't know, 14. So how can we do that? What can we do now to be able to participate then in the following year? That's okay. Move on to the next slide. That's good. So GRESB, uh, you know, our 2016 participants, there's just a list of them. This is going to go out to everybody so you can see uh, an idea of who participates. It's the who's who of private equity firms around the globe, 217 of them, and then 119 listed companies. Nope, keep going. That's good. All right, so here's our pyramid. Institutional investors are the top, and it flows down, right? They are the, the top of the pyramid, and they're driving the, the engagement on ESG down to the REITs that then go down to the portfolio managers that make it down into the property manager and facility manager level. So on the left-hand side, what you see are these labels that we talked about at the bottom early on, right? The, the building labels, and I've included well here as well. GRESB is a portfolio level assessment, and the, the vast majority of our participants are signatories to the UNPRI, and it's one thing to, to to signal that you're a signatory, it's another thing to actually do things and improve your portfolio, and that's where the GRESP framework comes into play. Go ahead. Okay, so this is an animated slide, and it, it shows, and just hit the go button, it shows the seven aspects of GRESP, and if you just click it, it should open up, hopefully, and show how the different weightings, there we go, the, the different weightings happen. So GRESP has seven aspects. What are you doing on the management side? Do you have uh, sustainability or ESG policies, and, and are you reporting and disclosing this in a transparent fashion? Uh, how do you do on the risks and opportunities in your portfolio? Do you have certified buildings? Do you engage your stakeholders, and in particular, on the real estate side, your tenants, right? Because if tenants, you know, institutional investors look at this and say, well, you know, the best way to preserve my capital flow and cash stream is to keep existing tenants in place. So having an engagement mechanism there is a, a particularly important aspect of real estate. And then obviously performance indicators. How are we doing on energy, water, waste, greenhouse gas emissions? Are they increasing? Are they decreasing? Are you implementing LED, you know, lighting retrofits and, and all the things that go into hopefully reducing those uh, imprints both on the environment as well as costs that go out the door uh, on the expense line within a real estate property port, uh, pro forma. Go ahead, next slide. All right, so the biggest hurdle in GRESP, the biggest hurdle, particularly for first-time participants, is wrapping your arms around the data that is required 
uh, to understand what's happening in your portfolio. You've got a portfolio of five or ten buildings. It's it's relatively straightforward to get that energy water waste data. You know, you can use the Energy Star portfolio management tool. You could track it yourselves and just just enter that in. But for portfolios that are sizable, and many of our our participants have hundred plus building portfolios, that's pretty hard. And so, um, you know, organizations hit the data wall. And so we have built out a group of partners, of which Gobi and Enernock are our premier partners. There, you know, we've got a host of others um, underneath the premier partner banner. Uh, but these firms do a great job of helping get over that portfolio data access hurdle uh, and and drive the implementation and measurement that's required to do a good job on GRESP. Go ahead. So GRESB is a process. It's, a, it's predictable, and I think I've got a slide on that in a little bit. Um, and we're nearing the open for 2017. It's open during the second quarter for participation. April 1st, the portal opens. Organizations get in there. On June 30th, the last day of the quarter, the portal closes. And we receive, you know, you know last year we had nearly 760 submissions. So when that happens, we go through a validation process of all of this data, and that's what this uh, slide here is meant to depict. So we, you know, validate and we read all these open text boxes. We look at the hyperlinks because Gresb says it's great that you're claiming that you do something, but we need some evidence. We need to validate this. Do you have a policy? Is there something on the web, a, a sustainability page on your website? Whatever those things are. So we go and we take a look at those. We have uh, a random allotment. Uh, and this process was developed by PricewaterhouseCoopers of organizations that come into Validation Plus. So then we really roll up our sleeves and we're, we're running through scripts and we're looking at data accuracy. And then also randomly, 2.5% of the organizations are picked for site visits. And that means that you get a visit from uh, some of the GRES team, could be myself, it could be my peers in Amsterdam. And we'll come and we'll spend a half a day and we'll sit down and we'll actually go through your submission and we'll look and, and, and understand how it came together. Uh, and so that's how we validate this data and it gets us on this track to what we call investment grade data that's very important to our institutional investor members and clients. Go ahead. All right. So three things to be aware of. Everybody that participates gets a scorecard. With GRESB, you can participate for free. There's no barrier. There's no cost barrier. Uh, and so when you hit that submit button, and when you hit the submit button in June, uh, we then go to work and we do this peer benchmarking. And the first week of September, all participants receive a scorecard. It's interesting, you know, but it's typically not sufficient because uh, people want to know more. Well, how did we score? What did we get on question 16? How can we improve and get better? Well, that's what the benchmark report is for. So GRESB has uh, roughly you know, 150 property companies and uh, private equity funds and, and listed companies that are our members. They get benchmark reports on all of their uh, submissions. This is something that organizations that are not members can certainly purchase a la carte. And then our members also get access to this portfolio analysis tool and they can run other uh, metrics and compare themselves against uh, peers. We do not disclose to anybody how you do uh, that is uh, a portfolio is uh, accessible to a limited partner who is a GRESB member to the extent that that LP requests your permission. If you're a listed company, your submission ends up in a data set that is subscribed to by some of our investor members, and they get access to the underlying fundamentals and the scoring of the benchmark report. Um, but it's not possible to go and see, for, for, for instance, how you know, JP Morgan cannot go and see how Morgan Stanley did, or TIA CREF, or others, right? Next slide. All right, so the 2017 uh, objective is, you know, we're spot on towards this investment grade data, and we developed this process with PwC in 2014. So the four things that we really focused on between 2016 and where we're heading now in, uh, into the April open are to be able to deliver increased data quality, and we do that through partners like Gobi and Enernock, to enforce some compliant reporting practices, some organizations, uh, claim scope one, others claim scope three. It creates a, sometimes an, uh, an unlevel playing field. 
And so we've written some scripts to enforce some of those mechanisms. Um, you know, and we want to always simplify and consolidate the process. So you'll find that for past participants, somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of the assessment will already be completed, and it just requires you to go through and check, no, we haven't changed any of our policies. Hey, we sold this building. We should eliminate it from this table. Some of those things. But for the most part, all of that data is there, ready for you to come back this year and, and provide the updates. Go ahead. Here's the timeline that I mentioned. April 1st, the GRESB assessment opens. Uh, organizations can get in there and start uploading their data. To the extent that you have your data complete and you're ready to submit on or before June 1st, you can request and, and our members can request a response check. It can, this can all, is also something that is purchased a la carte, right? And a response check is a high-level overview that somebody on the Amsterdam team will sit down and look at your assessment and say, Mm, you know, we're seeing some inconsistencies in certain data, perhaps you're not interpreting this question uh, appropriately, and give an opportunity to the uh, participant to mm, update their answers on some of those things uh, prior to the June 30th submission deadline. So on June 30, the portal closes. We go to work July and August when much of Europe goes on vacation. In September, we release those scorecards and benchmark reports. In November and December, we spend a lot of time uh, getting industry feedback, and it's that feedback that informs then the 2018 assessment. GRESB is designed to be stable. 80% or more this year, it's over 90% of it year on year is stable. So there's no like out of left field questions that are being asked, right? It's a very predictable uh, framework that it's a lot of input from the industry, so little refinements happen, but in general, it's very predictable. Okay, next. We have some training coming up. Um, that will be myself and Roxana Asayu, who is in our Amsterdam office, and she is the uh, head of the real estate assessment. So there are three different venues where we will be, San Francisco, New York, and Toronto on those dates. Morning is introduction, and afternoon is advanced. You can find out more about this on our website underneath uh, the events tab on the home page. Next. Something new for this year is we've created, and this only applies to listed property companies like REITs, uh, is a public disclosure assessment. So this is meant to be in tandem with the real estate assessment. This is a a grade that is offered based upon the transparency of sustainability practices as seen by a sustainability report, uh, URLs on your website having to do with sustainability and, and, and what you're doing within your portfolio, and other uh, disclosures on your annual reports or 10Ks and Qs. So we've done this for 400 listed property companies globally. And we have now, uh, this is something that was driven by our uh, request from our institutional investor members uh, wanting to understand who's doing well in disclosure, particularly because GRESB is voluntary. And we have a subset of listed companies that participate, many but not all. So this then allows us to uh, have something on all listed companies and encourages them to participate in GRESB. Go ahead. Ultimately, what this is, it's a communication framework. We have the, on the right-hand side the GRESB Real Estate Assessment, and that's the communication between institutional investors and portfolio owners, the REITs and the private equity funds. On the left-hand side, there's also the recognition that developers are often joint venture partners with portfolio owners, these REITs and private equity funds. They're also feeding them with product. So to that uh, extent, we have the GRESB Real Estate Developer Assessment. How are you doing as a developer? How do you benchmark against your peers when it comes to ESG practices within your development activities? So depending on who you are, you can choose the one on the right, the one on the left, but either way, uh, it's, uh, the only difference is that the Real Estate Developer Assessment is less focused on standing assets and capturing the data on energy, water, and waste. Uh, because there's the recognition that developers are in the development business and not in the property management and ownership business. Next slide. 
think we're getting ready to roll towards the end. Okay, so year on year participation, we're just going to roll through this quick. Grez started its first year, it had roughly 200 participants. Year on year on year on year, it's grown. Last year, nearly 760. Uh, and there's longevity with groups that participate year on year. So let's see the next slide. Aha. Okay, so this is the geographic distribution, 759 entities across 63 countries, and in total, there's 66,000 assets that are in these portfolios uh, covered across the globe. So it's a pretty big footprint uh, that GRESB is able to cover. Next slide. And you'll see on, on, you know, with the geographic distribution of this, right, uh, we're nearing 200 in North America. Uh, Gresba started in Amsterdam, so it's very engaged in, in the EU. And in Australia, I think we have nearly 100% market penetration. Next slide. From a money standpoint, the money's here. The money's here in the U.S. We have a, have a number of very large portfolios. You know, Morgan Stanley's fund is nearly $20 billion. Uh, JP Morgan's is very sizable. In Europe, there's smaller funds that participate, um, but either way, that's not a, some some metrics on our monetary coverage. Go ahead. Great. North America year on year continued growth and participation. The right hand side just gives some lists of the folks that participate: leading private equity funds, leading uh, REITs. Go ahead. The results show this pattern up and to the right. So what that means, if you look in the axis to the left, management and policy is on the left-hand side. Do you have procedures and management procedures to engage sustainability? And then the bottom axis is implementation and measurement. How are you doing? So in 2011, when organizations were asked about sustainability, uh, you know, they sort of scored where they did. So what's the first thing that you would do? You'd put management and policies into place upward motion in the aggregate data set showing 2012 and 2013. It takes a while to wrap your arms around the data and begin to implement and measure. So again, predictable, things started to move to the right from 2013 to 2014. And in 2016, organizations continue to get better. So the, you know, the average score is now up in the 60s. Australia by far is leading the charge. Uh, many of their property firms are in Sydney, so they have an opportunity to talk amongst one another and share best practices as opposed to a more diversified market like the United States. And listed companies do much better because they're typically more transparent about what they do. Go ahead. This is the point to make here, 3.9 difference between the upper right quadrant and the lower left quadrant. Sometimes it's difficult to understand the difference between a 45 and a 54 score on GRESB, but I can tell you assuredly that there is a difference between organizations that score in the 80s and organizations that score in the teens. And that's a very different risk profile, and that's very interesting in that distribution to institutional investors. Go ahead. Year on year, if you plot the organizations that participated year over year over year and have stuck with it, the original 100 roughly from 2010, they have climbed the ladder. And that cohort now averages 70 on GRESB. And it's no surprise that you know, the, the cohorts that are, are trailing behind that have done it for six years, five years, four years in a row, they're a little bit below that. Um, but it just shows the trajectory and what GRESB is designed to do, which is participate, get some results, Think about make you know think about what you want to do. Make some business decisions. Implement. Show up and benchmark yourself again in 2018. Do it again in 2019. That's what Gresb is designed to do. Next slide. And ultimately, this gets back to that distribution curve. This these are the results that we see out there. We have Gresb one to five star portfolios. You know the there's. Certainly portfolios that haven't participated yet. We don't know what they are. They're kind of dark. Uh, we have some in the lower left quadrant that uh, will get a one star. And we have others that are doing some really great things within their portfolio. And those are the five star uh, participants. All right, two more, three more slides, one on GRESB infrastructure. So this is what this assessment is meant to look at. Social infrastructure like hospitals and schools, uh, ports, toll roads, renewable energy. 
right? So if that is uh, something that uh, is, is anybody on the call has portfolios that look like that, Gresb Infrastructure is uh, an assessment for you. And I know that the folks at Gobi and Enronoc are engaged with, with helping organizations work the Gresb Infrastructure Assessment as well. On the next slide, you'll see the Gresb Debt. And Gresb Debt is targeted towards banks primary lenders, right, and, and private equity, equity debt funds that stepped into the void in 2008 when the banks retreated. And so we've gotten two years of data. We're seeing some positive engagement here, and there's, you know, some ideas as to uh, what our participants say that they do within their portfolios and the things that they track under risk management. Next slide. I think we might be at the end. Oh yes, the last thing. So Gresb Green Bond Guidelines. To the extent that you're a listed property company and you're interested in uh, raising debt capital by having a green bond, we've got some guidelines that uh, show what a valid green bond is in, in the marketplace for real estate companies. And in essence, it's, you know, do you have buildings that are leader energy star certified? Uh, do you, are you investing in energy, uh, water and waste improvements within your buildings. And so it goes into detail how to do that and uh, that typically makes the treasurer happy. Next slide. There you are. So with that, I'm gonna turn over to Gresb. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, <laughs> looking at my slide here. I'm gonna turn over to Gobi and I'm gonna monitor the chat function to the extent there are questions that show up here. I can uh, respond to those and I'll hang out for any questions at the end. Back to the Gobi team. So I'm seeing that Healy came off a of mute, but I'm not hearing Healy. All right, um, Dan, you hear me now? Yep, gotcha, perfect, right, way great. to go. You missed all the nice things I said about you. I don't know if I should repeat them. I just mentioned, uh, don't, uh, don't. Oh. <laughs> always a tough act to follow, the one and only Dan Winters. Um, uh, so thank, thank you, you. For, for joining us today. Um, just a housekeeping item, if anyone has questions, please submit them um, through the, the interface there and we'll get to them at the end. Um, so I'm going to quickly run through the Gobi portion and, um, and then, of course, uh, we want to get to Enernock as well. So let's talk about why 2017 is going to be the best year yet. A um, bit about us, so I see you uh, reviewing the folks that are on the line. A lot of Gobi friends, thank you for joining us. Um, for the folks that are just getting to know us or don't know us, um, a bit about our background. So between myself and the co-founders, um, my background's in architecture, spent the better part of a decade at Jones Lang LaSalle in commercial real estate. Uh, Chris Hap, Ryan Nelson, my partners, began their careers at PwC doing management strategy consulting, as well as Ariba, so software world. Um, and hence, our, our real estate technology company was born. At the end of 2015, we raised $5 million in, private, in venture capital money from a private equity real estate fund out of Toronto. Um, one of the biggest LPs in the fund is London-based, so definitely some international influence um, coming in at the end of last year. Uh, we're roughly 100 employees just moved into a brand new office in, in the Chicago Loop. Everyone is welcome to stop by when they're in town. We have a kegerator, a ping pong table, and anything else that makes you officially a cool tech firm. Um, and our output and focus is, is really our technology. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So this visual has kind of captured our mantra, our mission, if you will, from the beginning. Um, data, especially in real estate, lives in silos. So be it multiple systems, be it um, Excel spreadsheets, be it in people's brains, the data lives everywhere and our goal and mission is to get it to live in our real estate cloud. Um, consolidate it, streamline it, oftentimes for all types of reporting, be it GRES, CDP, um, investor reporting, CSR reporting, whatever it is that you're doing, it's a lot, it all starts from the same source, which is a utility bill. Um, you can go to the next slide. Keep going, please. 
All right, um, and a bit about the partnership. So, not sure if everyone has heard, but Gobi and Enernock are officially partnered up. It's been um, a bit over a year now, and we have some great success stories together. Um, so, just some background on the partnership. Um, it really enables us, it brings together two industry leaders and amplifies what we each do best. So Enernock leads the market with real-time energy management and Gobi's expertise is bill and sustainability management. Um, it allows each of us to stay laser focused, so where we used to overlap and compete a bit, now we found that if we each stick to our own differentiated niche, we're better together. So very excited about that partnership and excited to hear um, what Enernock has to say as well. Um, so three solutions for Gobi at the moment as far as our technology goes. Invoice automation, so utility bill management, bill payment, that type of thing. Energy management, um, procurement, hedging strategies, um, all types of energy management with regards to portfolios. And sustainability reporting, so grads, CDP, um, Energy Star, LEED, etc. Um, so a bit about the past year. So 2016 was a super exciting year for us. Um, Every U.S. fund that we submitted earned a green star, which is obviously the top honor available via GRES, which is something we're really proud of. Um, you can go to the next one. Um, our clients have seen an average improvement of 35% from their 2015 to 2016 scores, so pretty significant jump. I know Dan talked about there really is a, a big difference between the top 10% and the bottom 10%, so a 35% jump is, um, is certainly impactful. Um, 50% of our clients scored within the top five of their sector, and we have a handful of sector leaders as well. So again, very proud of that. Um, proud of our clients for doing all the right things, but um, you know, happy to help them capture and report that um, so that they're successful. So a couple of results. There are just a couple of funds to focus on from last year. Um, I mentioned sector leader. Um, I think I saw Aaron on the line, so shout out to Pine Tree. It's great. First year reporting. Sector leader. Amazing. Success story. Um, Cousins, Federal Realty Investment Trust, you could see federal 97% increase. I mean, so, so really good stuff, and um, uh, the results are real. Um, so I like to think about, we're, we're almost in March, around the corner. It's a deadline coming up, right? So taxes. So we, we did what we did in 2016. We, we spent money. We made money. Um, the, the books closed on the year December 31st, right? And now it's time to report on what we did. Um, similarly with GRESB, um, and this is something that w with new folks we talk about, you're really talking about, if you're getting started now, you're talking about closed books on last year. So there's not really much time to influence and as we approach that July 1st deadline, um, you know, we're really talking about a, a complete year. So I, I do equate it and think about it um, as far as taxes go and you want to be constantly thinking about, of course, the year to come because the reporting is in arrears. So time is always of the essence um, on that note. So if you look at a timeline, um, we're, in, we're in the interesting timing now. Um, if we were to start with a, working with a, with a client at the beginning of the year, say, so we have a kickoff meeting, we talk about why we're doing things, we work on gathering all the KPI data, we work on the survey. Um, when, the, when it opens, we're able to do the reporting. Um, and then after the survey closes, that's when our hard work and our, our push and our um, tax season, if you will, is done. But that's when Dan Winters and team get very little sleep um, doing all the reviews. And then the season picks up again, of course, later on. But there, it's, it's not really, um, the way I see it, it's not really a season. It's, it's constantly ongoing because while we're worried about reporting on what we did last year, right now we're already doing things that are going imp to impact the report next year. So you always have to be thinking not about reporting the past but what you're doing right now to influence your future. Um, so if you're new to GRESB, there's benefits, you benchmark against your peers, um, you get some transparency, take a deeper look at your policies and really get to know yourself. Um, there's a plan of action, so it's a it's a systematic process that we look at. Um, it's very it's very methodical in approach, and it's what enables us to help our clients see the results that we um, had shared a bit earlier. Um, and then we talk about you know it's an ongoing process, so it's a it's a life cycle, if you will. 
Um, so it starts off and then we continue to improve, we continue to organize, we, intinu we continue to drive transparency for folks within the organization as well as investors and other people outside of the organization um, and just continue to improve down to the property level all the way up to where it influences the whole portfolio performance. If you're a veteran player, so there's still, you know, you say I'm five years in, well, you're not done. There's still work to be done. There's always work to be done. Um, it's a constant work in progress. So there's refining, fine-tuning, additional goals, um, can always improve transparency and certainly always improve data collection. As Dan mentioned, that's one of the biggest challenges. Um, and it's a similar plan of action, so you're working on always reporting in arrears, but then always trying to move the needle in preparation for the following year. Um, you always, you, most clients want to ensure that the executive team and investors are engaged, that they're, um, you know, always in, they're involved with the results, they're involved with the mission and why the company is doing this, um, and setting goals for the future. All right. Um, and then, you know, you, you start off with the low-hanging fruit and perhaps years one, two, that, that's what you focus on. But as you go on and fine-tune, um, there's more to be done. And, and um, so the, per the point is that whether you're a beginner or a veteran player, um, there's always plenty to do. And, and the myth or the common misconception that you might plateau is not, we haven't found that to be accurate at all. Um, so the key focus is for us, it's KPI data, it's continuity, and there's a consulting component as well. So while GRESB is, you know, roughly half driven by energy, water, waste data, how, how um, aggressively and, and accurately you can capture and completely you can capture that data. So the other half is um, a lot of soul searching within your organization. Who are we? Are we doing the right things? Do we have the right policies in place? Do we have the ability to enforce them? And so one thing that's unique about Gobi is that we're offering that all under one roof. So we're neither just consulting nor just technology. It's under one roof and it's a seamless process for delivery um, and it's easy. Can you do it alone? So there are many people that do it alone. Um, my favorite types of clients to work with are not the ones that uh, start from the get-go and say, ah, we'd like to try this Grez thing. We're, Gobi, can you help us out? It's actually the folks that have tried to do it alone for like one or two years and then come to us and are like, yep, we need you. This is, this is serious business. Um, so to answer the question of can you do it alone, um, I like to pose back another question. Can you diagnose your own ailments? So you have a couple options, um, you know, tear an ACL. You can go to the doctor or you can, you know, do it alone and WebMD and try to brainstorm, figure out solutions. Maybe if you're really aggressive, you Google um, some, some remedies and, and do it yourself. So it's just, um, you know, <laughs> a light, a, a play on an analogy, but yeah, so you can do it alone, but it's, it's a lot easier when you have an expert guiding you, um, an experienced expert that's going to provide a prescribed methodology that's proven to be effective. Um, and, and again, just a bit about our mantra without getting into too much of the nuts and bolts of what we do and how we do it, though we're happy to talk with you about that anytime. It all starts with a bill. So we're, we're working on a good system to streamline and collect bills, utility bills, to digitize them, to validate them. Um, once they're in our system, we have algorithms that will double check and look for anomalies and outliers and flag them. Once the data is all organized, um, the outputs and the connections on the back end to our software can be infinite. So we're always trying to stay cutting edge with what's on that right hand side. So be it SASB, be it GRES, be it CDP, and then take advantage also of the overlap. So for example, there's, um, you know, it's been tossed out that there's roughly 75% overlap in the types of data you need for GRES and CDP. So why do that twice? Or why have multiple consultants? Or why have multiple Excel sheets? Um, we don't think you should. Um, so that's kind of the, the vision behind what we do and how we do it. So that's it. Wanted to get through quickly, save time for our partner, Enernock. Um, email me anytime, call, text, happy to talk to you about GRESB and, and anything else. And most importantly, thank you for joining us today and taking the time. I know everyone's super busy. And don't forget to submit any questions that you have, and we'll try to save some time for those at the end. So with that, I will pass the torch to Dan from Enernock. Great, can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? 
Yep, Dan, this is Dan. You're good. Go ahead. All right, great. Thanks a lot. Just wanted to, previous technical difficulties, want to make sure we're all clear. Thanks, guys, and uh, thanks, Healy. And hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about driving progress across the portfolio to help improve your GREZ results. First of all, background on me. As Meg said, my name is Dan Lake. I'm an energy advisor working with Enerox commercial and industrial customers. I've worked as an energy engineer and advisor for over five years, and as a licensed mechanical engineer and energy advisor at Enernox, I help our CNI customers achieve success in their energy management goals through the use of our energy intelligence software. Next. Before we get started, I'd like to provide a little bit of background on Enernox and our products and services. Enernox provides energy intelligence software and professional services, which means we provide a comprehensive solution that we customize for our customers to help reduce overall energy spend and maximize the value of their properties. Our energy procurement tools and services help ensure the best price and contract terms for our customers' energy supply agreements and create more accurate budgets. Our software solutions provide visibility into real-time energy data, tools to optimize facility operations, and, project tra and project tracking to help our customers coordinate their energy efficiency efforts. And our industry-leading demand response and demand management tools help maximize the financial value of energy management at the site level by creating new sources of revenue and helping to keep their monthly energy spend to a minimum. Next. Where Healy just shared some best practices to make GRES reporting more accurate and automated, I'm going to talk a little bit about what it takes at the portfolio level to drive energy management progress in your portfolio from a building operations standpoint. GRES is a reflection of your building's ESG performance to investors, and it's becoming universal in the commercial real estate world. Reporting accuracy is of paramount importance, but investors are also coming to expect progress and efficiency from an energy management perspective as well. Next. So I'm going to, I'm going to discuss a recent energy, energy efficiency success story for one of our customers in the commercial real estate sector. First, I'll take a walk through the products and services this customer uses, get into how they've been using them, and then I'll dive into what we did in 2016 to help this customer capitalize on some of the really valuable opportunities which led to their decision to expand their partnership with Enernoc to cover an additional 20 sites across our portfolio, and which will help their GRES results, keep their GRES results competitive in the years ahead. Next. Our energy intelligence software leverages customer energy data in the form of building electrical meter data and automatically identifies actionable energy savings measures. For this particular customer, we're streaming real-time energy data for all of their sites to identify opportunities to improve efficiency in operations on a weekly basis and we push these opportunities to them using our software. Next. Here are just a few examples of the types of measures that we identify. When a measure is identified, energy and cost savings are automatically estimated and surfaced within the software. A lot of these cost savings opportunities stem from the unnecessary energy consumption outside of operating hours. Identifying issues like high energy consumption on weekends and holidays or building startup and shutdown processes that don't align with operational schedules can make a big difference. We've also found that these issues can reemerge once they've been resolved. Energy data can reveal things like bugs in building management and automation systems or malfunctioning equipment and help customers resolve them before incurring the cost on their utility bills. Checking, checking for these types of operational opportunities on an ongoing basis ensures that our customers are as efficient as possible without jeopardizing tenant needs and comfort. Next. This screenshot shows our project manager feature. <clears throat> when our software identifies an opportunity to improve energy efficiency, a recommended action is automatically populated in project manager, where our customers can view all identified measures and sort by measure type, buildings in their portfolio, and estimated savings. As you can see on the right, these recommendations come complete with projected financial savings and an estimated simple payback calculated for the measures that might require some investment to push through to implementation. Next. While evaluating and implementing a new measure, our customers have access to a detailed explanation of the identified issue as well as a breakdown of the recommended actions needed for implementation. 
Users also have the ability to upload and view files related to measures, as well as provide comments to collaborate and coordinate their efforts. Next. For this particular customer, we found that even with all this information available to them, some of the biggest opportunities with the greatest financial impact weren't being implemented. We had buy-in from the highest levels of their organization, but only individuals at the site level, usually building engineers, were accessing the identified measures. Due to this disconnect, we found that measures being identified were not being pushed to implementation. We needed to bridge the gap between those, highest levels of the, those in the highest levels of the organization for whom operational efficiency was a priority with those at the site level. Next. The top priority of any building engineer, their top priorities for any building engineer revolve around the building and equipment upkeep and tenant needs. This often leaves leaves them pulled in multiple directions. This also tends to push the efficiency of building operations to the bottom of their list of priorities. Not necessarily because they don't see the value in efficient building operations, but because it has not been presented as a priority and may be seen as an extra or outside of their job. Additionally, incentives, recognition, and job performance are often tied to those top level priorities and not efficient building operations. Next. What we found for this particular customer was that while the building engineers had all the information on potential energy savings available to them, they didn't really have any incentive to capture those savings. As I stated earlier, building engineers' top priority is property upkeep and tenant comfort and satisfaction. So even though they know that energy efficiency measures can save their organization money, they don't necessarily think that anyone will recognize the effort they put, put in to implement them. There's not always a clear-cut system of recognition and accountability to show building engineers or building operators that this is the priority and that their good work won't go unnoticed. For this customer, building engineers didn't always see the incentives to improve building efficiency. There was no upside to pushing measures to, to implement it, and there was sometimes a perceived risk to tenant comfort. Often, the best-case scenario is that a building engineer would go through the trouble of implementing a measure that would improve energy efficiency and cut operational costs, and they'd, but they'd receive no recognition for that. Next. To drive accountability and make this process easier for users, we began to push emails directly to the site engineers, as well as their asset managers overseeing the portfolio to put information into, right, into the right hands that could drive action. Emitted emails break down the financial impact of the measures that have been implemented, as well as projected savings for the outstanding measures that have yet been put in place. These emails are delivered on a weekly basis to alert users to actionable measures and provided, provide visibility and regular updates into what is being done to actually capitalize on the potential value laid out by our software. Next. By involving individuals within the organization above the site level and connecting them to those people at the site level, a framework of recognition and accountability was possible. The asset managers saw the value and wanted to find a way to show building engineers that it was a priority capture it. In addition, the weekly emails, we created customized monthly reports showing the financial impact of energy efficiency measures at their sites, along with a breakdown of how measure implementation is progressing. Again, putting information into the right hands within the organization drove action and the progress that our customer really wanted to see. Next. By engaging asset managers and building engineers together, we fostered an atmosphere of collaboration and recognition that drove action and accountability. All of this encouraged a focus on energy management at the building level, with visibility into the performance of their site. Extending from the building level to the asset level, the company incorporated energy management into their operation. This new approach had a big impact in the value delivered to our customer. Next. Prior to taking this new approach, the company had seen about $40,000 in implemented savings across their properties. In the six-month period after taking this new approach, they increased their implemented savings to nearly $500,000. And going forward, we'll continue to identify additional savings for this company through our existing tools and those we continue to develop. With these tools and processes in place, to capitalize on opportunities and to improve sustainability as well as to make their GRES reporting easier and more accurate, the company is in a great position to maximize the value of their upcoming 2017 GRES reporting season. Next. Thank you guys for taking the time. Sorry I had to rush a little bit. Um, you can feel free to reach out to me with any questions um, and learn more about Internoc and our uh, services and software at our website.
And now I'm going to hand it off to Meg to start the Q&A session. Thanks. Okay. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Let me know if not. This is Healy. I'm, I'm actually just going to do Q&A um, for Meg. So one question that came through, um, definitely a good one. I'm going to read it out loud and then I will answer it. So for a hypothetical company with a hundred asset portfolio, please explain number one internally how many if any full-time equivalent employees will be needed to be dedicated to GRESP efforts or two if instead a company hires a third-party consultant to help with GRESP submission what is the ballpark cost of this hiring for the hundred asset portfolio and even with this hiring how much manpower is still needed on the internal side to be dedicated to manage that effort so a um, couple things going on in this question I will field this one um, and since I think it's specifically about providing GRESP services. So how many dedicated FT can you replace? So of course I'm going to give you the, the typical response that you might want to hear is it depends. So we work with a lot of organizations and some of them have a full-time in-house dedicated 100% um, salaried employee that is the director of sustainability or um, functions and that function. Some folks have uh, someone that's partially dedicated. So I'm the head of asset management or I'm the director of property management but um, 50% of my time is also that the head of sustainability. And some folks have no one at all, um, and they look to third-party providers and consultants to provide everything. So I'll say, in either case, it's hard to say, like, I can't tell you you'll eliminate 1.5 heads or one head. But what I can tell you is, in any scenario, so if you have a full-time sustainability director, that's no reason not to have a consultant, because you'll find that that full-time sustainability director spends most of their time being... Um, a data aggregator, so they're chasing properties for utility bills, they're chasing utilities for utility bills, they're in the weeds, they're in Excel, and they're not really doing what you hired them for in the first place, which is strategic sustainability portfolio management to really move the needle and have um, a mission and a vision for your organization. So you want to get them out of the weeds a bit um, and, and have them be able to have a third-party provider to support the heavy lifting, at least on the data side, so that they can you know, move the needle in a meaningful way and focus on other things. If you have someone that's half doing it, um, I think that we, there's one I'm, client I'm thinking of in particular now that just says it's, depending on the size of the portfolio, this particular one was big, but it's, it's not possible. You know, Being the director of asset management, the director of property management is a full-time job, and you're not an expert at sustainability, and it's impossible to keep up with trends and what's new and what's changing and, and all that type of thing. So um, a very long-winded answer. I, I don't know how many F you can replace, but what I can say is in any scenario, whether you have a full-time dedicated person, a part-time dedicated person, or no person, um, there's certain ways that you can engage a consultant accordingly and benefit no matter what. And then the second part of your question, what is the cost? So, of course, it varies on the scope. So if you have, you're doing completely outsourced services where you say, um, I want you to be my, my visionary, my executor, um, everything from soup to nuts, that's a different cost than if you say I have an internal full-time person but just want to hire you guys for data support and technology. Um, so a bit different there. How much manpower is still needed internally? So still some, right? So it can't be done in a vacuum. It's not the kind of thing where you can hire a consultant, send them off running, and then see them in a couple months with a completed GRESP report. There, we need to engage with your organization. We need to get information from your organization, and I would say the first year is definitely the most intensive, working back and forth, getting to know each other, getting policies and plans in place, set up, and implemented, and then the subsequent years get a bit easier um, just because you know the intimacy with the organization grows and you're kind of, um, it, it turns more to like a tuning and a fine tuning rather than in a big initial setup. So I hope that addressed the question. Um, and let's see, we got another question that came in. Okay, for the GRES public disclosure assessment, will companies have a chance to review and respond to scores? When will this happen? I think that Great might question. be um, a Dan Winters question. Yes, yeah, I jumped on it. I knew that that one was for me. Let me, know, um, let me repeat so, it. Yeah. Nope, I got it. The, uh, so in April 1st, when the portal opens, uh, there is a section within the portal that uh, is devoted to the GRES public disclosure score. So the way that this was, uh, you know, the, the preliminary uh, grades that were provided uh, had to do with the success or lack thereof of certain uh, GRES staff members that were able to find 
uh, information and run them through the methodology that we created. So to the extent that things were missed and a sustainability report has been recently published or there are things in the 10Ks or Qs, you know, please, the, the portal is there to upload those. Uh, all of the information that's offered will be reassessed. And then right now the preliminary grades are only uh, internal to us and they're not published anywhere. And these will be released in September when the, all of the other GRESB uh, results are released. Back to the participants. Other questions? All right. Um, no other questions have come through at the moment, and we are right at the top of the hour. So with respect to everyone's time, um, I think we can wrap up. So like we said, j just housekeeping items, there will be a recording available. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Um, anything else to add? Or right, Thank you to Dan and Dan for, um, for speaking with us today. And um, that's about it. Be in touch. Don't be a stranger. We're around to help you. Good work. Thank you, Healy.